Turn in your Bibles to Revelation, the 21st chapter, Revelation, the 21st chapter. We're looking at those first eight verses today, and I want to read them, and then we're going to pray and get going here. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the, from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through faith in Christ we escape the wrath to come. We thank you that you have revealed to us that which is to come. We thank you that we have an opportunity here today to worship in song and word and around the Lord's table. Father, it has been mentioned earlier, we have those that that are struggling with their health, We pray that you would touch their bodies. We pray for full healing for Shar, for uh, for Mary, for uh, Jocelyn, for others, Father, that we we know of that are struggling with their health. And we pray, Father, that you would protect this body of believers. There's a lot of uh, different uh, sickness going around. I pray that you would help there. But more than that, Father, we have a great need. We need to hear from you. Our spiritual lives need to be in order. There may be some here today who have yet to understand what it is to trust Christ as Savior, and they stand on the edge of eternity. And I pray that you would help them to know. Help me to proclaim, the listener and myself, is that we would both respond as we should. In Christ's name, amen. Christians love to sing about heaven. We love to sing about heaven and our future in Christ. We should, because it reminds us of what is to come, what's before us. A couple of things here. I see I'm short on time and long on sermon, so, but I would note that I'm already way over, right? Time change? <laughs> Colossians 3. One through two, therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. We sing about heaven. We think about heaven. We think about our future. I'm an American citizen, but in reality, for each believer, our citizenship far outweighs what we have here. Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven. That's where it's at. From which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is before us reminds us that in this life we live here and now. It should be done for the glory of the Lord. With what's to come, this life should be done for the glory of the Lord and lived out knowing that our inheritance is in heaven and we will one day experience that fully. Just a reminder, I praise God that we're in this 21st chapter. There's this... uh, divine outline of the book therefore the lord said to john write the things which you have seen and the things which are those things which were in the past the things which are that those were the uh, chapters two and three that was uh, john address uh, the lord addressing the churches and the things to come that was chapter four and five we had this preview of our heavenly home but when you get to chapter six right through chapter 20 we uh we saw the the wrath of god the tribulation period he had that was before us, and I got to chapter 21. I've been looking forward to this chapter. It's kind of like take a break, step back, and rejoice, right? Rejoice. Here we are. 
So let's first observe the new heaven and the new earth. This is what comes next. There's an outline on the back of your bulletin. If you would like to make some notes, John said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, the first earth passed away. There's no longer any sea. This is what comes next. When John said, says, then I saw, he indicates that this will immediately follow the previous chapter's events, chapter 20. We've had, if you'll remember, as we've gone through the book of Revelation, just a number of interludes in the narrative in this book. Otherwise, it's just laid out chronologically. But those narratives, we, we were given information that helped us fill in the details so it would help our understanding. But there's been this flow, this one after another flow of the sequence and events that have been set before us. A new heaven and a new earth. The word new here means something brand new, something never before seen. Peter describes this in 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, which the heavens will pass away with a roar. And elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. This may be news to you, but what we have here one day is all going to be gone. It's going to be made brand new. He goes on to say, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? Again, with what's to come, it should affect how we live. In verse 12, Looking for and hastening the coming day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt, melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's coming. It's going to be here one day. Again, it's, this is new. It's brand new. Now the word roar, he talked about that. It has the idea of a, a loud rushing, like the crashing of waves, of uh, the sound of an intense storm. I think all of us have, have been in a severe storm. I don't know if we've all been in a tornado, but if you've been around them, you will witness a deafening roar, a sound. Peter says that's what's coming. That's what's coming. Now, I want you to know that uh, God has all this in order. This will not occur a day before or a day after. God is in complete charge. We in charge of all things and we live in a in a in a in a time in our society when all the talk is about well it used to be global warming before that it was uh it was the ice age before that was acid rain some of us remember some of these things these predictions now it's uh it's climate change now it was global warming and the predictions are out there and we've read them and, and seen them about when the earth uh, the earth's coming to an end and blah 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 uh, i want you to know something there's a promise God's word that's worth marking in your Bible. This was given to Noah while the earth remains. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. I want you to mark that. Uh, I'm not saying we don't need to be good stewards of what we have. We should be. But uh, God is going to sustain this earth until he's ready to do, do it in, until he's ready to make a new one. Now, there are three heavens referred to in Scripture. We've just read heaven and earth is going to pass away, and it's going to be burned up. And you might say, well, wait a minute, what's that all about? There are three heavens referred to in Scripture. The throne of God or God's abode is one. The other two are, are, are the earth and its atmosphere. Those, those two would, would be seen as two other heavens where the birds fly, where the planets and stars are. It's the last two. The earth and the planets and stars where the birds fly. This is the last two that are being referred to. Now, this is a fulfillment. This is a fulfillment of what God has said he's going to do all along. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and former things will not be remembered or come to mind. God says, I'm going to do this. And if you remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, the curse of sin came, and the whole earth felt it. And the earth, according to Romans 8, it groans under the weight of this. It's going to be made new. When the heavens and earth are destroyed, they will be created brand new. Heaven is referred to in Scripture more than 500 times, 48 times in this book. Uh, scripture differentiates between those three heavens. The first heaven is earth's atmosphere. Genesis 1.20, God said, let the waters teem and swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. He's talking about the earth and what's, what's here. He refers to that as heaven. 
Genesis 22 where am I at here? 22:17. Indeed, I'll greatly bless you, and I'll greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. Your seed shall possess the gates of the enemy. So again, he's saying the stars. He's seeing, seeing that as well. That's the second heaven. I skipped past Genesis 15:15. 15, 15. Again, again, that's a that's a note toward the second heaven as well. We might refer to it as outer space. The third heaven. The third heaven is where God dwells. That's where he dwells. That's his abode. Psalm 14, 2, the Lord has looked down from heaven. Again, that's the third heaven he's referring to. Daniel 2, 28, however, there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Again, that's the heaven. That's where our God is at. That's where our Savior's at today. That's where we will one day be. Jesus resides there. He was taken up into heaven. Acts 111, they also said this is at his ascension. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Jesus has just been taken up from them. This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. That reference is to, is to raid into, into heaven itself where God is. 1 Peter 3.22, of Jesus, he's at the right hand of God having gone into heaven. That's that third heaven as we would see it. So the abode of God is where all believers go immediately upon death. This is where, um, where we go when we hear the, when the rapture comes, we will go there. This is where the Lord has gone to prepare a place for us, according to John 14. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He sees it. So there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, not the third heaven, not where God is at, but earth and the atmosphere above that. That's what's coming. And I believe it, it will occur exactly as it's stated. And you know what? We can rest with that. And it kind of makes sense. If you, if you understand that as believers, we've been made a new creation. And again, I referenced, I, I don't have a, a, a scripture for you. I didn't put it on the, on, on the PowerPoint. But Romans 8 talks about the heavens are, are groaning under the weight, or excuse me, earth is groaning under the weight of sin. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, which I don't know exactly what that looks like for us. I've always thought with the new earth, I, I, I'm kind of hoping, like I can see here in Bark River what it used to look like before, before the curse, before the flood and all that. I would like to see that. I'm not sure that's going to happen, though. And I really don't get to be the one that calls that shot. You probably know that, right? But there's a new heaven and an earth. New heaven and earth is coming. There's a new city. Look at verse 2. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adored for her husband. Uh, we get a glimpse of this New Jerusalem here. Now, it's described in vivid detail. We'll handle that next week, verses 9 to 27. But this New Jeros Jerusalem will be created by God. It's not built by the hands of men. As such, it will be perfect in every way, in every detail. It will be extravagant, breathtaking, uh, and amazing in its beauty and enormity. It's huge. We will have access to this city, which comes down out of heaven to earth. It's a brand new Jerusalem. It's a new city. We have this new heaven, new earth, this new city. We will get to participate. We'll see it. There's a new relationship as well. Look at verse 3. Again, where we're at here, we've stepped into the eternal state. Okay? This is our inheritance. As believers, this is what we'll see. This is what we'll be a, a, a part of. This new relationship, verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. No, there will be uh, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Wow. This new relationship. Now, as followers of Christ, we have an amazing relationship with him at this moment. It is amazing. I, I praise God for that. One of the aspects of this relationship in heaven, though, is it, it's its promised presence of, of, of the Lord himself. God will be among us, and he will do this in the person of Jesus Christ. We will see him as he dwells among us. 
and we are physically in his presence and he in ours. We will see him. Have you ever thought about what Jesus would look like? We will see him. We will know. You know, we may not have had the privilege of walking with him on the streets of Jerusalem in his ministry 2,000 years ago like the other disciples, but, but we will see him. We'll have a privilege, that privilege in heaven. Can you imagine that? We will no longer be doing battle with the old man. I can't wait. I can't wait. The old nature, the old man who's within, who uh, when we give in, we do sinful and foolish things. To be unhindered in that way, in that day, in that moment will be amazing. I can't wait. You know, we will never say to him, I've sinned. I need your forgiveness. That'll be over. That'll be over. Have you ever looked back on your walk with the Lord and thought, if I had it to do over again, I would never had fill in the blank. Or I would have fill in the blank. Now, this, this is a brand new relationship. Our sin nature will be done away with as we are perfectly perfect. We'll never look back at our time in heaven and think, I wish I had never... Or I wish I had, I had this. We'll never have that. Never, have, uh, never feel a, a tinge of guilt or regret. The Spirit of God will not convict us of something that we have done sinful in that place. We'll have no fears, no tears, no death, no pain. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. I could mourn and grieve every day at this age in my life, knowing so many situations and things that have gone on and loved ones that have departed, and so I could grieve every day. I'll never grieve in that place. Uh, the process of one's body succumbing to death will be something we will never be part of again. And all God's people said, amen. <laughs> you never watch anybody die. We'll never have to be beside a loved one's uh, deathbed. Never again. Never have a cold. No crying or pain, no mourning. Uh, it'll be like it was in the garden before Adam and Eve sinned. You know, for a while, they never dealt with allergies or colds or decay of any kind at all. We do today. New relationship. New relationship. Look at this new moment. New moment. It's beautiful. Verses 5 to 7. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This new moment. I want you to know, first of all, it's true. It's true. It's true. He says to John, "Right, for these words are faithful and true. Behold, I'm making things, all things new, right, for these words are faithful and true. And I just want to start there. Faithful and true. It's get used again in, in the same statement in, in, chapter, in chapter 22, verse 6, that same phrase. These words are faithful and, and true. And why did the Spirit of God mention this to John twice? Many of us have read this many times, but John had never wrote this. He'd never heard this. He's hearing it for the first time. And I think John may have been asking himself if, if what he was hearing was right and if it was real and if it was true. Remember where he's at. He's been exiled for the name of Christ. He's on the island of Patmos. And what is be re being revealed to him is a, a stunning scene concerning his future, concerning our future as well. Was it too good to be true? No, it's clearly stated twice to reassure him that what he was hearing was the reality that he and every believer would experience. 
Jesus' words resonate here as John had recorded them earlier. In John 17, 17, sanctify them or set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. It is. You can trust it. God has never lied. And he is being straight up truthful here. We can trust him. And our future stands secure on the promises of God. I don't think I've ever done a funeral without reading verses 1 through 5. And I read those because I want that set before those who are grieving. But the phrase that resonates in my heart today, and one that I think of so often, is what our Lord says here in verse 5. Behold, I'm making all things new. Behold, I'm making all things new. If you mark your Bible, you need to mark that. It must be this way. It has to be this way. Praise the Lord that he will. He will do that one day. If you're a believer, he's already done this in many ways. As, as someone who's trusted Christ, you have forgiveness. You have imputed righteousness. You have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have his presence. You have a new inheritance. You have a new and future hope, a daily bread, an assurance. But he makes all things new. He makes all things new, and he must, and he will. I can't wait. can't wait for that moment. You'll never shed a tear in, in heaven. I was talking to someone the other day, and I said, you know, crying is for here on earth. He's going to wipe away every tear. There will be some tears, but then they will be gone. And I believe he does something with our minds He's certainly going to enlighten us to a greater degree because we are going to understand that there are those who we have loved who are not there. And I'm not sure how God is going to do it, but heaven will be heaven. And then he says it's done in verses 6 and 7. It is done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. It is done. I, Jesus, have done this, Alpha and Omega, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. We see that he's the beginning and the end of all things, and, and that his power knows no boundaries, and the risen King of kings will make all things new. According to John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, Jesus, he created all things, and he has a right power and authority to do as he sees fit, and this is as he sees fit. Verse 7 says, he, will, he who overcomes will inherit these things. I think there are times we feel, feel far from being overcomers, but the key to having this as one's future and hope and permanent residence is being an overcomer. Who are they? Who are they? According to 1 John 5, 4 through 5, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Who's the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Overcomers are followers of Christ. They are believers. That's who they are. God has provided for us something that's absolutely amazing. It's called grace salvation Ephesians 2 5 through 7 even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ for by grace you've been saved this is how we have access to this and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus as a believer God sees us already seated with Christ so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And every believer says, praise the Lord. There's grace that is greater than all our sin. There's quite a contrast here. Look at verse 8. For the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, they... Their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with, in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's a contrast here, a big contrast. There are some who are exempt from this blessing, from this inheritance, from the joy of eternity with God. We covered that a bit last week. There is no universal salvation, not according to God's word and according to the future. 
See here it says for the cowardly and unbelieving. The unbelieving is the is the is the real key there. They've not trusted Christ as Savior. There's no hope for them. They are exempt from heaven. And that is a sad, sad day. To have heaven as, as, as your future home, to experience all things made new, one must be made new. One must be a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. How are we made new? We have, must be in Christ. We must have come to a point where we've acknowledged our sin. We understand we're, we're desperate sinners in need of a Savior, and we trust Christ as Savior. When that happens, this is a reality. We're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He, the Father, made him the Son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, through faith in Christ, we have the righteousness of the perfect righteousness of Jesus placed on, on, on oneself. It's imputed righteousness. It's transferred righteousness. That's, that's a great news of the gospel. In Christ, that's what we are. I finish with this thought. Live a life pleasing to God, knowing that the best is yet to come. You guys are going to go out of here, and what are you going to do today? You're going to sit down to a meal, right? It's never, I, I save talking about food till the end. We just have to do that. At the end of that meal, what are you going to have? Peach pie, cherry pie, I don't know. Yeah, dessert of some sort, right? And we look at those meals, and we eat that meal, and we say, the best is yet to come. Can't wait. Can't wait. It's the climax of the meal that has been set before us. Brothers and sisters, we have seen today the climax of our relationship of Christ for all eternity. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Live in light of that. Live a life pleasing to God, knowing that the best is yet to come. We're going to sing about heaven. In just a moment, I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I'll close in prayer. You guys will get on your feet, uh, and then we will sing about our future. Loving Father, thank you that it is clear. Thank you for doing this. It is by your grace. We are undeserved. We, we don't deserve this. We're undeserving. We, we can't earn it, but by your grace, through faith in Christ, you have bestowed on us a future inheritance that is incorruptible, imperishable, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven by you. Thank you for that. Bless your people. In Christ's name, amen.